Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon to you all. Welcome to this Knowledge Academy and this presentation on Customs Valuation. I am Laksiman Babaji from the Valuation Subdirectorate of the Tariffs and Trade Affairs Directorate of the WCO Secretariat. In this session, I will cover the background to the WTO Valuation Agreement and Transaction Value Method which will be followed by a question and answer session. Let us first look at the historical background and give you some institutional perspective of what happened since 1947 and even before. So as the world has progressed rapidly in the international trade arena, the application of different and arbitrary valuation systems became a major obstacle to the continued smooth transition to the globalization and liberalization of industrial international trade. An additional burden was that such tariff agreements as they were then could not function efficiently because the valuation systems of the day enable the act of duty assessment to be manipulated unilaterally by altering the valuation criteria. As a result of these inadequacies at the start of the 20th century, these affected trade and industry sectors undertook a number of studies with a view to replacing the arbitrary valuation systems that were in place with an international system which would be fair and neutral in its application. You see on your slide, we start with 1947, but it's, in fact, it did not start in 47, it started even before. So the League of Nations examined these value and trade related needs, but agreement on a set of general principles, focus on solution, was not reached until the United Nations Conference on, Emplo on Trade and Employment was held in 1947 in Geneva. So the conclusions of this conference were embodied in Article 7 of the GATT. This set of principles, however, provided little guidance regarding their practical application. What happened is the European Customs Study Group was established in Brussels in 1947 with a series of tasks based on international cooperation in the area of customs valuation. These tasks included the drafting of a definition of value for use within a customs union framework. The group was also required to study methods and procedures within which a value definition could be applied. So if you look at the uh, slide, you'll see 1947, the GATT, and after that, we see on the right top part of the slide, that creation of the study group. And then we've seen that in 1950, the convention establishing a customs cooperation council was signed in Brussels, that's in 1950. 1952, the convention entered into force on the 4th of November. And in 1953, we had the first inaugural session of the customs cooperation council, which was held on 26 January. So every year, in fact, we celebrate this day as the International Customs Day. So it was open with 17 founding members. So you'll see that, in fact, in 1950, that was not the only convention that was signed. We have also two other conventions. The second convention is a convention on valuation for custom purposes, and the second one is one on classification. Let's look at the pathway that the system, the valuation system have uh, evolved through. So we have in 1947, the Article 7 of the GATT, which I mentioned earlier. In 1950, we have, in fact, the 
group, the study group, they completed the text in 1949, and which was based on the principles set out in Article 7 of the GAP. The definition was incorporated in the Convention on the Valuation of Goods for Custom Purposes, which was signed in Brussels on 15 December 1950. So it's another convention which I mentioned earlier and entered into effect on 28th July 1953. And it became known as the Brussels definition of value. So you see there's like some linkage with the creation of the Customs Corporation Council and the entry into force of the Convention on the Valuation of Goods for Custom Purposes. So between 1973 and 1979, a new phase in the history of customs value was taking place. The GATT multilateral trade negotiations known as the Tokyo Round took place in Geneva. This round of multilateral trade talks represented the most significant trade policy discussions for a long period of time. So the primary objective of the Tokyo Round was to achieve the expansion and ever greater liberalization of world trade inter alia through the progressive dismantling of obstacles to trade. One way in which to achieve this goal was the adoption of a common international valuation system, which would be more widely accepted and result in a more uniform and positive valuation basis, one which would also be more acceptable. As a result of the Tokyo Round, the agreement on implementation of Article 7 of the GATT, known as the GATT Valuation Code, was adopted, establishing a positive system of customs valuation based on the price actually paid or payable for imported goods. The foundation of this code was to provide a fair, uniform, and neutral system for the valuation of imported goods for custom purposes, conforming with commercial reality and outlawing the use of arbitrary and fictitious customs values. The reduction or elimination of restrictions on international trade were also a basis of this valuation discipline. Article 7 of the GATT also promotes the facilitation of trade and is purposeful in its recognition of international requirements and principles. It also established an open and transparent foundation for customs value, which should be based on competitive actual value rather than arbitrary and fictitious values. The GATT Valuation Code, based on Article 7 of the GATT, came into effect on 1st of January 1981, with 25 contracting parties. It is relevant to both FOB and CIF countries, as opposed to the BDV in its first introduction in 1953, which only accommodated CIF countries. The BDV was eventually amended in 19. 74 to include FOB countries. In 1986 and 19, between 1986 and 93, in fact, took place the Uruguay round. So the Gold remained in force and change until 1994, when the eighth round of multilateral trade negotiations, known as the Uruguay Round, were finalized and reported in the Marrakesh Declaration in, of April 1994. The Uruguay Round, in fact, commenced in September 1986, and negotiations substantially concluded in 1993. This round was initiated by some countries who were concerned that there was a drifting by a number of countries back to a protectionist focus as a result of a downturn of the world economy. Some developing countries also expressed their concern that by signing the agreement, they would lose their ability to continue their fight against fraud, pollution fraud. In 1994, the agreement on the implementation of Article 7 was signed and in uh, on 1st of January 1995 the WTO the World Trade Organization was established
So in 1947, we have the Article 7, which I've already mentioned earlier, Tokyo Round in 1979, and Uruguay Round in 1993, which uh, culminated with the creation, the formation of the WTO in 1995. We have also seen the WTO agreement, which is the same as the pollution code and the new WTO decisions. I've mentioned earlier the Brussels definition of value. I think it's important that we refresh ourselves with what it was. So the Brussels definition of value dates back to early 1950. It's based on the normal price and it is a notional concept based on open market price in assumed conditions that goods would be valued, to be valued would be sold. The essential elements of the Brussels definition of value are price, time, place, quantity, and commercial level. Let's now have a look at the WTO Customs Valuation Agreement and the text. The WCO, in fact, the, all the text of the agreement, the WTO Customs Valuation Agreement, and Article 7 of the CAT, and Technical Committee Instruments are included in the WCO Customs Valuation, the Valuation Compendium. So we also have online the uh, Compendium is also available online and in the hard copy. Let us have a look now at the two important committees that have been established under the agreement on the implementation of Article 7 of CAT 1994. We see on our left a committee on customs valuation. This is a committee that has been established under Article 18 of the agreement, and it is a committee that's held its meeting at the WTO headquarters in Geneva. And most of the uh, participants to the committee would be people from the trade. And on the right, we have a technical committee on customs valuation, which has also been established under the agreement. So for this technical committee, it is held at the headquarters of the WCO. And normally, it will be attended by delegates from customs. And the instruments that are issued by the technical committee would be advisory opinions, commentaries, case studies, explanatory notes, and studies. We have up to now, I think, more than 100 instruments, such instruments. On the other hand, the Committee on Customs Valuation has issued decisions. There are seven important decisions that have been issued, and all, all of these are available in the WCO Valuation Compendium. So what is the Technical Committee on Customs Valuation? The Technical Committee on Customs Valuation, as I mentioned earlier, has been established under the auspices of the World Customs Organization, and its responsibilities include to ensure uniformity of treatment. It also has a responsibility to examine specific te technical problems, draft instruments, study evaluation laws, procedures, and practices, and facilitate uh, technical assistance. Article 7 of GATT, the basic principles is for first, it, the value, customs value, should be based on the actual value of the imported merchandise. And we are not ascertainable, use nearest ascertainable equivalent value. And it must not be based on arbitrary or fictitious values. The actual value may be represented by the invoice price. This is, these are the basic principles of the Article 7 of the GATT. And as you would have noted, it's not 
very practical because it doesn't provide you the how, how to implement this Article 7. It tells you, it doesn't say how it should be implemented. So let's look at the general uh, introductory commentary of the agreement. So there's like a small shift where it's now we move to the transaction value. So the primary basis for the customs value under the agreement would be the transaction value, which is equal to the price actually paid or payable plus certain adjustments. The transaction value is to be used to the greatest extent possible. And in cases where the transaction value cannot be accepted, then there must be a process of consultation with the importer to look for the most appropriate means to determine the customs value. In this uh, uh, agreement, there are several uh, methods for valuing goods. In fact, there are six methods, and all the methods have to be applied in a in the order in which they are they appear. There, there is a hierarchy of valuation methods. We have to start with uh, valuation method one, first, two, three, four, five, and six in general. So we also have to use generally accepted accounting principles whenever we are determining the value under the agreement. So the custom value of imported goods shall be the transaction value. That is the price actually paid or payable. So the agreement in fact constitutes of four parts and then three annexes. In part one, it talks about the rules on customs valuation, and we have seven, 17 articles. Article one is a transaction value of the imported goods. So it's related to the price paid or payable. Article two is the transaction value of identical goods. Article three is the transaction value of similar goods method. Article four is not a valuation method, but it is an option that's given to importers to request the order of applying the articles four and five. In the absence of such a request, normally article four will be applied first before article five. In the case the importer requests for a change in, uh, uh, in the order, then customs, the value of custom will have to be determined under the provisions of article five, provided all the informations are available to apply article five. And then if not, then Article 4, move to Article 6 as the last uh, method. Article 5 is the detective method, and Article 6 is a computed value method. Article 7, which is a last method, fallback method, is also known as a loss resort method. We have Article 8, which is not a valuation method, but it's important when we are applying Article 1 because these are the adjustments that have to be made to the price actually paid or payable to arrive at the transaction value and customs value. Article 9 is about the currency conversion. 10 is for the confidentiality of information received from importer not to be shared to other persons. Article 11 is a right that's given to importers, a right to appeal without penalty against the decision of uh, customs administration in relation to the evaluation of imported goods. Article 12 is about the publication of laws giving effect to the agreement. This is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, transparent part of the agreement because it ob obliges the, uh, uh, the member to publish Publish all the laws that give effect to this agreement. Article 13, it's another uh, right. So it's a right given to uh, importers to obtain the release of their goods whenever there's a delay in the final determination of the value of the imported goods. Of course, provided that uh, there is a, a provision of sufficient guarantee in the form of a surety deposit. Uh, for which the goods may be liable. We have Article 14. Article 14, in fact, 
mentioned that the annexes, the free annexes of the agreement, Annex 1, 2, and 3, they are in, an integral part of the agreement. So these are parts of the agreement also. Article 15 gives some definition of some terms that are used in the agreement, not all the terms, but some terms, very important. For example, it says what is the definition of the customs value, what are related, who are related parties, what are identical goods, what are uh, similar goods, etc., which are important when we apply the provisions of the agreement. Article 16 is another article that provides, confers rights to importers. It confers a right to a written explanation from customs administration how the value was determined if that's requested in writing. Article 17, this one is a right given to customs administration. It gives customs administration the right to be satisfied that all the information, all the declaration statements that are made are true and accurate. These are articles 17, and that's the end of part one. In part two, we have two articles, articles 18 and 19. Articles 18 and 19 talks about the administration, consultation, and dispute settlement. I've mentioned already Article 18, the which there are two uh, committees, the Committee on Customs Valuation and the Technical Committee of, on Customs Valuation are established. Then we have the Consultation and Dispute Settlement uh, uh, under Article 19. Part three, uh, Article 20, on the Article 20, it talks about the special and differential treatment provided to uh, developing uh, countries. So they are given special treatment so that they are given time to uh, implement uh, completely, fully the provisions of the agreement. Part four, these are final provisions and article, there are three articles, 21 to 24. And then we have three annexes, Annex 1, 2, and 3. So Annex 1, uh, it gives you uh, interpretative notes. Annex 2 is about the running of the technical committee, and Annex 3 is explains more about the special and differential treatment. And paragraph 7 of Annex 3 is an important uh, addition to the definition of the price actually paid or payable that we will be looking at in the next presentation. So welcome to this uh, presentation on the transaction value. As I mentioned earlier, the customs value in the agreement is based on the transaction value. So transaction value is very important and uh, we are going to look at the uh, transaction value during this part of the presentation. So according to Article 1 of the agreement, it says that the customs value of imported goods shall be the transaction value. That is the price actually paid or payable for goods when sold for export to the country of importation adjusted in accordance with the provisions of Article 8 of the Valuation Agreement, provided certain conditions are satisfied. We have four conditions. We will deal with those conditions uh, in, uh, later on. And Article 1 has to be read concurrently with Article 8. Article 8 is about uh, adjustments made to the price actually paid or payable. So as you, as you can see in the definition, so the customs value is the price actually paid or payable for goods when sold for export. So before we go to the, that part of sale, it says that the transaction value is the price actually paid or payable. So what is the price actually paid or payable? The price, the price actually paid or payable is the total payment made or to be made by the buyer to or for the benefit of the seller for the imported goods. There's no need for a, an involvement of transfer of money. It could be letters of credit or other negotiable instrument. The payment may be direct or indirect and includes all payments actually made or to be made as a condition of sale 
by the buyer to the seller or by the buyer to a third party to satisfy an obligation of the seller. That's part paragraph seven of Annex three, which I mentioned earlier. So activities undertaken by the buyer on the buyer's own account are not considered to be an indirect payment to the seller. Therefore, they are not to be added to the price actually paid or payable. So we have to differentiate between the buyer's own account. It is something that he, on his own, decide to spend his money. So that's in accordance to the Note 2 Article 1. So as I mentioned earlier, the transaction value is a price actually paid or payable for the goods whenever there is a sale for export. So in the agreement, however, there is no definition of sale. So we need to find a meaning of sale. So there is a common meaning of sale. So a, a sale would normally involve a transfer of property from one party to another for some consideration. Normally, usually that would be in financial form and it's a price. And that price has to be offered by the seller and agreed by the buyer. So that would be like the common ingredients for a sale to occur. So in the agreement, there is no defini definition of sale. So what has happened is the first uh, uh, instrument that was uh, uh, approved by the committee, technical committee, was one regarding the concept of sale. So instead of trying to define the sale, the technical committee has found it easier to illustrate or give examples where there is no sale. So when there is no sale, which means that if they are not considered as sale, would imply that they are sales. So what are the uh, examples of no sale? Firstly, we have free of charge shipments, goods imported on consignment, goods imported by intermediaries who do not purchase the goods, goods imported by branches, place goods, good supply on loan, waste or scrap for destruction in the importing country, goods which are the subject of barter or compensation, or it could be like gifts also, gifts. Very often we see that people send gifts to their uh, friends, family members. So whenever these goods are uh, exported, there is no sale. So in these cases, what do we have to do? So we will go into the process uh, in the coming slides. So these are situations where there would be no sales. So a sale for export would imply a transfer of ownership resulting in the exportations of the goods to the country of importation. So it means that during that uh, process, the transaction, the goods should be should involve an actual international transfer of goods. They should move from one territory, customs territory, to another customs territory. That's uh, what's provided in the advisory opinion 14.1. And it also says that the buyer and the seller, they may be located in the country, the same country. It doesn't matter if the buyer and the seller are in the same country. What is the most important thing is that there is a sale and the goods have involved in an international transfer of goods. They have moved from one customs territory to another. Let's have a look at this example. We have in this example, sorry. We have in this example, a seller who is located in country X and a buyer who is located in country I. The sale is a sale for a cement in retail packing. So the buyer is buying cement in retail packing. The seller, the seller sell the cement in bulk to country T, where the wrapping and packaging by the seller uh, are done. After the wrapping and packaging, the goods are sent to the buyer in country I. So we see here there are different transactions. So movement of the goods from 
country X to country T and then country T to country I. And the sale is between a seller who is located in country X and uh, importer, a buyer who is located in country I. So would this, would this be considered as a sale for export? Yes, it, it, is a, it is a sale for export because there is a sale and there is an actual movement of goods from one custom territory to another. So that's also provided in article, pardon, uh, in uh, advisory opinion 14.1. Let's look at another example. Sorry. So we have a seller S and a buyer by, and a buyer B. The oh, the seller sorry is located in country X and the buyer is located in country I. The sale initially is made to buyer B1, and while the goods are on the vessel on high C, the buyer B1 reject the sale for some commercial reason. He said he could not buy the goods. And while the goods are still on the high sea, the seller S finds another buyer in the country I, and the goods are sold to B2. So in this scenario, what would be the, what would be the sale to be considered as a sale for export? Is it the sale between S and B1 or S and B2? According to uh, advisory opinion one, the sale between S and B2 would be the sale for export to country I. There is another scenario where we have a series of sale. In a series of sale, one scenario would be like this. We have a retailer who is located in country Z. He orders goods from a distributor in country Y is company B. The distributor is company B. The distributor is not the manufacturer of the goods, so he will order, he will order the manufacturer from a manufacturer who is located in another country X and is company C. So First order is made from company A to company B. And following the order received from company A, company B requests from company C to manufacture the goods. In this case, they are 100, 1,000 pounds. So in the sale between the distributor and the retailer, the selling price is at 10 currency units. And the company B, the distributor, when he orders the manufacturer to sell him the goods, the pens are sold at eight currency units. What happens eventually? Company C, on behalf of company B, ship the goods to company A. So the goods, in fact, have moved from A country X to country Z. So in this case, we see that there are a series of sales. In a series of sales, so we have an, an, an instrument which has been issued by the technical committee that we deals with series of sale. So which sale according to this uh, uh, instrument would be considered as a sale for export? According to that instrument, it is a sale between company B and company A, which is a sale for export. So this instrument is commentary 21, 22.1, and the technical committee view that the underlying assumption of Article 1 is that normally the buyer would be located in the country of importation, and that the price actually paid or payable would be based on the price paid by this buyer. In a series of sales situations, the price actually paid or payable for the imported goods when sold for export to the country of importation is the price paid in the last sale occurring prior to the introduction of the goods in the country of importation instead of the first or earlier sale. This is consistent with the purpose and overall text of the agreement. So 
these are some like the scenarios where we have to look at sales. So what are sales for export? What are sales and what are sales for exports? So we have seen three examples, uh, uh, goods that are shipped directly but are transited in another country, goods that are sold for export, but while the goods are on high sea, the seller, the buyer rejects this transaction and the seller finds another buyer in the same country. So that last transaction would be considered as a sale for export. And we lastly look at the in the series of sale transactions. I've mentioned earlier that to apply the transaction value, there must be a sale. And of course, there are some conditions that have to be applied. In fact, there are four conditions. The first condition is that there should be no restriction on the disposition or use of the goods by the buyer. Second condition is that the seller or price, the sorry, the sale or price is not subject to any condition or consideration for which a value cannot be determined with respect to the imported goods. And thirdly, no proceeds from the resale of the goods will accrue to the seller. Last condition, the buyer and seller should not be related. Or if they are related, the transaction value is acceptable for custom purposes. Let's have a look at the, uh, those conditions. The first condition is that the there should be no restriction as to the disposition or use of the goods by the buyer. There are exceptions. Exceptions are those that are imposed by the legislation of the import, import, importing country or by the authorities in the importing country or there are restrictions that restrict the geographical area in which the goods could be sold. And thirdly, the restriction that does not have an influence on the price actually paid or payable. It does not have any influence. So that would be a restriction. For example, one example of a restriction is I, I sell, I, I am a seller, I sell the goods to a buyer and I impose a restriction that he cannot sell the goods to another country. He can only sell the goods to the country where, to the country where the goods have been imported. So this is a restriction, but it is not a restriction that uh, impacts on the, that impact on the uh, value. So the second condition is that the sale or price is not subject to any condition or consideration. Let's have a look at some examples that are provided in the, uh, in the text. So first example is that the seller establishes the price of the imported goods on condition that the buyer will also buy other goods in specified quantities. So if you buy suitcases and shoes, I will sell the suitcases at 50 currency units if I, you buy shoes at 30 currency units per piece also. So this is a con condition or consideration for which a value cannot be uh, determined. Another condition is the price of the imported goods is dependent upon the price of, or prices at which the buyer of the imported goods sell other goods to the seller. In this case, we have the seller buying goods to the buyer and the buyer also selling goods to the seller. So if the price would depend on the price that the other will sell the goods to uh, the other, then that would be a consideration for which a value cannot be determined. A third example is one where the price is established on the basis of a form Hi, Luxman. Can of I... payment extraneous, sorry, um... yes. Okay, I uh, just need to leave the WCO at the moment, but the presentation software will continue to record once I'm gone. So are you happy with just finishing off the presentation? Now? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not and, now. Like you can, you can continue and yeah, it'll okay. automatically record. So you can finish uh, the recording. Yeah, okay, I'll okay, do, do that. Yeah, okay. As long as you're happy with that, I'm really sorry.
So I just continue. In fact, I don't have uh, many presentation, many slides to, to show. So it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so just uh, once you finish, just close the program, and it should be good. Okay. Thanks. Good. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry about all this. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. So, in this case, we have the seller selling wood to the buyer at the price of 1,000 currency unit. And the buyer has, according to the contract, after he manufactures table from the wood, he has to send three pieces of the table to the seller. So the price of the wood is established on the form of the extraneous, the payment of extraneous to the imported goods, that is the table. So you, I sell you the, the wood at this price, but you have to send me uh, some finished product eventually after you manufacture. So in this case, uh, uh, it would be a condition that would not allow the uh, application of transaction value under Article 1. So we also have two uh, other remaining conditions. So the uh, next one is about proceeds. It says that no proceeds of any subsequent resale, disposal, or use of the goods by the buyer will accrue directly or indirectly to the seller, unless an appropriate adjustment can be made in accordance with the provisions of Article 8. So if an appropriate adjustment under Article 8 can be made, then it would not be a condition that would uh, impact on the transaction value. If not, then we cannot apply the transaction value method. Of course, we have to distinguish between proceeds and dividends and other types of payments, like royalties and license fees. So these are covered, would be covered under uh, the next presentation that uh, would follow under uh, Article 8 adjustment. The last condition to be satisfied to be able to uh, apply the transaction value Article 1 method is that the buyer and seller should not be related. Or if they are related, the transaction value is acceptable for custom purposes. So Article 1.2a provides that in determining whether the transaction value is acceptable, the fact that the buyer and seller are related within the meaning of Article 15 shall not be in, in itself grounds for regarding the transaction value as unacceptable. So in such cases, the circumstances surrounding the sale shall be examined and the transaction value shall be accepted, provided that the relationship did not influence the price. So the, agree the agreement provides for some methods to determine whether the relationship has influenced the price. We have uh, in Article 1.2b, it provides some test values that, to be, that are to be used by the importer to demonstrate that the transaction value closely appro approximate to some of test values. In the absence of test values, the administration, the customs administration has to examine the circumstances surrounding the sale to determine whether the relationship has influenced the price. Examining the circumstances surrounding the sale would, would mean looking at the relationship between the buyer and the seller, how they organize their business, and how the price has been set. So these are covered in more detail in the coming presentation. So we will now talk about some, like, uh, some of the elements that need to be considered when we look at the uh, transaction value, the price uh, actually paid or payable. Discount. First item I would look at is discount. So discount, this is a commercial practice, common commercial practice, and it will be acceptable if they are legitimate. And if it is negotiated between the buyer and the seller, and if that discount pertains to the goods being valued and the transaction value is the price actually paid or payable. So 
whatever has been paid, actually paid or payable, that would be the basis to determine the transaction value. So we have different types of discount. Common, a common uh, type of discount is cash discount. So the importer, buyer A, he will receive a 5% discount if the payment is made in cash within 10 days of invoice day. So that's the condition that the exporter B, the seller, would, uh, would need to allow the discount. So in this case, if the importer makes the payment within 10 days, he will be entitled to the 5% discount and the net amount paid would be the basis to, the, to be the uh, customs value, the transaction value. We also have other types of discounts. So we have quantity discount. These are designed to encourage buyers to purchase in bulk. So the larger the quantity or, uh, ordered, the lower would be the unit price. And it may, it may also require several purchasers to be made before it takes effect. So that would depend on the contract of sale. So in this case, custom would check that the discount offer is genuine and how the discount is obtained. There is an exception to discount if that discount ref refers to previously imported goods. That would mean that it is a retrospective discount and retrospective discount will, will be dealt with as credit. And because they are not, do not pertain to the goods being valued, they will not be considered in the valuation of the goods which are being valued. One other uh, common, like uh, I would say, uh, commercial practice that we have now is flash sale. Everywhere, every time you'll see flash sales. Flash sales doesn't pertain only to uh, e-platform, but it also exists on other types of sales. So it's a promotional sales offered in the short term. And it, very often it is very highly discounted. The price is highly discounted and it is done to attract potential purchasers probably to buy other goods. So the question is, would that highly discounted price in a flash sale be acceptable under the Article 1 of the agreement? So latest uh, uh, instrument issued by the Technical Committee, advisory opinion on this issue, says that the discounted price for imported goods purchased during a flash sale is accepted as a basis for, con uh, for a customs evaluation, provided all the conditions for applying Article 1 are met. And it also uh, highlights that for applying either the transaction value of identical goods or transaction value of similar goods, only if those goods fall under, within a definition in Article 15.2 of the agreement and all the requirements of Article 2 and 3 are met. Uh, we are talking about the same commercial practices and market conditions. And it also highlights that it is very unlikely that the commercial practices and market conditions prevailing and the flash sales would exist in situations other than flash sales. There is an, there is an exception also, which I've mentioned earlier, is expenses incurred by the buyer on his own account. So I think it's very important that we distinguish between activities undertaken by the buyer on his own account, because this would not be part of the customs value. So the note, interpretative note to Article 1, it says that activities undertaken by the buyer on the buyer's own account, other than those for which an adjustment is provided in Article 8, are not considered to be indirect payment to the seller even though they might be regarded as of benefit to the seller. So the cost of such activities shall not therefore be added to the price actually paid or payable in determining customs value. The price actually paid or payable excludes certain charges or costs. So the customs value, according to interpretative note to article one, shall exclude the following charges or costs, provided that they are distinguished from the price actually paid or payable for imported goods. They are, in fact, uh, post importation charges. So we see like charges for construction, erection, assembly, 
undertaken after importation on imported goods, such as industrial plant, machinery, or equipment. So the cost of transport after importation, after the goods have been imported, the cost of transport inside the importing country. Duties and taxes of the import of the country of importation would not be uh, part of the customs value, of course, provided that they are distinguished. So that's all that I have for this um, presentation on transaction value. I will end my presentation here and I will invite you for any question or comment that you have uh, for the, on the question and answer part. Thank you so much. Lead to the WTO Secretariat. Lexamon? La première question euh, vient d'être posée euh, par le secteur privé qui voudrait savoir si le secteur privé donc, peut demander conseil, un conseil euh, technique directement euh, au secrétariat de l'OMD pour des questions d'ordre technique. Donc. I think you might be on mute, uh, Luc Simon. No, it's okay. Yep, perfect. Yep, okay. So, members of WCO have the right, of course, to ask for assistance from the Secretariat and also to the Technical Committee. So, we have devised a form for such requests. So, whenever a member is asking for advice or assistance, we have devised in the form to precise whether the question is put to the Secretariat or to the Technical Committee. When it's put to the Secretariat, we will normally use all the instruments that have been issued by the Technical Committee to provide, to attempt to provide a response to the member. But if the member wants to have this question examined by the Technical Committee, which is its right, so the Secretariat will uh, process the question and put it to the technical committee. That's the right and that's the procedure that we normally do when we receive questions or requests for advice from members. Remember that we only... If you can, if you can maybe stop here, just let, just let the interpreter interpret this part and then you can continue, please. Thank you. Oui, donc, uh, bien entendu, tous les membres de l'OMD ont, ont le droit de poser des questions techniques, demander des conseils techniques au secrétariat et au comité technique. Alors, il existe un formulaire que les membres peuvent utiliser à cet effet pour spécifier s'ils posent leurs questions, demandent l'avis technique du secrétariat lui-même ou du comité technique. S'il s'agit d'une question posée au secrétariat, alors le secrétariat utilise tous les instruments à sa disposition pour tenter de répondre à cette question technique. Si par contre, un membre souhaite que sa question soit posée au comité technique, alors c'est le secrétariat lui-même qui transmet cette question au comité technique. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, this secretariat will uh, provide advice only to its members, not the public. Il faut bien sûr que je précise que le secrétariat donnera des conseils uniquement aux membres, mais non pas du tout au secteur privé, donc au public en général. Thank you for this reply, uh, Lexman. So the next question is, who gets to participate in the WCO Technical Committee on Customs Valuation that you mentioned in your presentation? Can the private sector also join it? La question yeah. suivante est de savoir qui euh, peut euh, devenir membre du comité technique pour l'évaluation en douane dont vous avez parlé tout à l'heure. Euh, Est-ce seulement les membres du comité de, de, de l'OMD, pardon, ou bien les représentants du secteur privé peuvent-ils également euh, participer, être membres donc, de ce comité technique Members of the WTO, remember that this is a WTO agreement. 
So members of the WTO are de facto mem uh, sorry, members of the WTO are de facto uh, can attend the technical committee on customs valuation. So we also have other, uh, I would say, um, attendees to the uh, technical committee. First, we have WCO members. WCO members who are members of WTO, they are de facto uh, delegate to the technical committee. WCO members who are not members of WTO may attend the technical committee, but with observer status. We also have a private international organization like the OECD, the Inter International Chamber of Commerce. They do attend the technical committee, but still they have the observer status. Last is the WTO. The WTO Secretariat can also attend the technical committee, but having the observer status. So these are the four types of uh, categories that can attend the technical committee, but with different status. De, de membres. Tout d'abord, il y a les membres, les membres de, de l'OMC qui peuvent participer aux travaux du comité technique. Ensuite, il y a les membres de l'OMD qui sont membres de l'OMC. Euh, eux aussi peuvent participer aux travaux du comité technique. Et puis, il y a les membres de l'OMD euh, qui ne sont pas membres de l'OMC et qui peuvent participer, mais uniquement en tant qu'observateurs. Et puis, il y a aussi certaines organisations internationales du type OCDE ou la Chambre de commerce internationale qui peuvent également participer, mais là aussi en tant qu'observateurs. Et quant à, au secrétariat de l'OMC, lui aussi peut participer aux travaux euh, du comité technique, mais une fois de plus en tant qu'observateur. Thank you, Maximilian. And there's another question, but, but, but it's linked to, to your answer, in fact. Um, and it goes like this. What are the methods on customs valuation that are allowed under the WTO agreement on customs valuation, the ACV? If I've uh, got the question correctly, is, is yeah. Do you want me to repeat it before? I can repeat the question. Oui, volontiers. Yeah. So the questions are, what are the methods on customs valuation allowed under the WTO agreement on customs valuation, the ACV? Les méthodes d'évaluation en douane qui sont permises en vertu de l'accord de l'OMC. The agreement on implementation of Article 7 of the CAT 1994, which is also commonly known as the WTO Valuation Agreement, provides for six methods. I've already explained that in my presentation. There are six methods, but the primary basis for valuing imported goods would be the transaction value method. This is the mostly used uh, method. And uh, this is also appears in the uh, preamble of the agreement. So the primary basis for valuing imported goods shall be the transaction value method. Then there are certain conditions that have to be applied before you can apply this provision, this Article 1. If for some reasons you cannot apply Article 1, then you have to use the alternative methods. In fact, we have five alternative methods. The first one, the first alternative method would be the transaction value of identical goods. The second uh, method would be, second alternative method would be the transaction value of similar goods. And if you cannot use the transaction value of similar goods, then you move to the other method, which is the deductive method. If you cannot use the deductive method, then you have to use the um, uh, 
calculated method. And if you cannot use a calculated method, then you use a fallback method. These are six methods, but remember, they have to be applied in that order. It is an obligation to use the order. It's a hierarchy of methods, so they have to be applied in that hierarchy. Thank you. That was a very detailed yeah. answer, and I hope our interpreter has got time to, to jot down at least these methods. It may, it may be a little, a little bit technical. Um, I, don't, I don't know if our, our interpreter wants to take it, or I can also refer our participants to your presentation that will be available on the event website. So they can go and, and have a look at it, and they can also have further readings on the WCO website. Bien, alors, euh, pardon, l'organisateur le, 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 euh, enfin, rend la vie facile à, à l'interprète. Il dit que, effectivement, comme précisait l'intervenant, euh, l'accord euh, euh, de, de l'OMC en son article 7, l'article 7 de l'accord de GATT de 1994, prévoit six méthodes, six méthodes que j'ai d'ailleurs euh, euh, élaborées, dont, euh, de, que j'ai répertoriées dans mon exposé. Et dit l'organisateur, euh, ces différentes méthodes, euh, vous pourrez les trouver chacun d'entre vous lorsque vous serez l'exposé écrit euh, de la présentation qui vient d'être faite. Mais il faut préciser que ces méthodes doivent être euh, euh, recourues dans l'ordre qui est précisé. Donc, il faut passer d'abord par la méthode 1, la méthode 2, etc. pour en, en arriver enfin, s'il le faut, à la méthode 6. Mais tout cela se trouvera dans l'exposé écrit de l'intervenant. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll try we'll try another question, and this one maybe is a little bit um, more specific from an important. So he wants to know: Does customs have the right to reject a value declared by an importer? C'est une question qui vient d'un importateur. Est-ce que la douane a le droit de rejeter la, vale, la valeur telle que euh, affirmée, telle qu'indiquée par l'importateur Of course, customs has this right to reject uh, the value declared by the importer. I've already mentioned some conditions that have to be satisfied. We have uh, the four conditions, but there's also in addition to those four conditions, there, there is that uh, what they call reason to doubt, where customs doubt the value. So when customs doubt the value, if let's say an importer declares a value which is very low, that would arouse some doubt in that customs official. But having the doubt does not mean that you can reject the value outright. It's only a doubt. So you have to confirm that doubt whether it persists. So there is a procedure. There is a procedure that uh, is, has been established uh, in decision 6.1 of the Committee on Customs Valuation. I will allow the translator. Voilà, donc, euh, oui, bien sûr, la douane peut toujours rejeter euh, une valeur euh, telle que déclarée par l'importateur. Il y a quatre conditions dans lesquelles euh, la douane peut rejeter une, une, une valeur qui a été indiquée. Et une autre condition, en quelque sorte, qui est celle de reason to avoir des raisons de douter euh, de la valeur telle que déclarée. Effectivement, euh, si une déclaration paraît particulièrement faible par rapport à la valeur euh, estimée euh, de la marchandise, euh, ça peut susciter de nombreux doutes dans le chef du douanier. Donc, mais ça ne, peut pas, ça ne signifie pas pour autant qu'on peut tout simplement rejeter la valeur déclarée. Il faut confirmer le doute, avoir des éléments de preuve. Et ceci trouve, se trouve d'ailleurs dans les saisons 6.1 du comité technique sur l'évaluation en douane. Je pense que j'ai mentionné la décision 6.1 du comité en question de valuation. So c'est une décision du comité de la valeur en douane. Uh, uh, so I was saying that uh, we have some procedures that have been established, some procedures that have been established in decision 6.1. So we have to give, uh, uh, ask for more information from the importer, examine those information that have been provided by the importer, 
and then there should be a communication process, a consultation process. And before making a decision, then you should have, you should provide the importer with the grounds for which you have doubt on the declared value. So yes, customs, customs has a right to reject a transaction value. In fact, it's provided in Article 17, which says that customs has the right to be satisfied about the truth, accuracy of any declared, any declarations, any statements that have been made by the importer in relation to the imported goods. So that's a right given to the uh, custom, but also it also the agreement also provides rights to the importers to have written you know explanation of how custom has determined the value. It's not a one-way process; it's a two-way process. Uh, may I add, uh, if that if the importer is not satisfied with the uh, decision of customs, it has a right to dispute. It has a right of appeal, right of appeal, and that right of appeal is without penalty. That's provided in the agreement, and it's all aligned in the national legislation of all WTO member countries. Alors, um... Euh, il existe euh, donc des procédures euh, en vertu de la, du, du point, euh, de la décision 6.1. Euh, tout d'abord, la douane, dans un tel cas, s'il soupçonne qu'il y a euh, sous-évaluation, en fait, euh, peut demander à l'importateur de fournir des informations supplémentaires. Ensuite, il y a un processus de consultation. Mais avant toute décision prise par euh, euh, la douane, la douane doit se justifier euh, de sa décision. Euh, donc oui, effectivement, il existe un droit pour la douane, mais il existe un droit également pour l'importateur, c'est-à-dire que celui-ci peut exiger des explications. Et s'il si les, les, n'est pas convaincu par les explications fournies par la douane, il peut contester cette décision, il peut faire appel de cette décision, mais cet appel se fait sans pénalité aucune, et ces dispositions se trouvent ancrées dans les dispositions nationales de tous les pays. Thank you, I, I just want to remind the participants that we are putting some of the questions that you sent to us during the session. The others that are more, I would say, country specific, they will be replied by um, the speaker uh, directly to the person who is asking them so that we don't take the time of uh, the other participants, but they will be replied. Those that are relevant and require a reply, we will reply to them. J'aimerais préciser euh, que là, nous avons sélectionné certaines questions seulement à, à poser à notre intervenant. S'il si y a d'autres questions qui ont été posées, mais qui concernent plus spécifiquement la situation d'un pays donné, ces questions recevront également une réponse de la part de notre intervenant, mais par la suite uniquement. Thank you. Um... I will ask maybe one last question to, to our speaker here. Um, it, it comes from an importer again. It says, I'm an importer and I want to know if I can obtain advanced rulings on customs valuation that are actually binding. Voilà une toute dernière question, elle aussi euh, euh, posée par un importateur. Cet importateur nous dit, euh, nous demande plutôt, puis-je obtenir euh, des décisions euh, prises, euh, des décisions à l'avance, qui ce seraient des, qui seraient des décisions donc prises à l'avance et qui seraient contraignantes euh, pour toutes les transactions que j'envisage d'effectuer. Yes, I would like to say that the agreement on trade facilitation provides for uh, the provision of advanced ruling. So every member will have the uh, obligation to provide advanced ruling. But it is mandatory to provide advanced ruling on classification and origin. However, for customs valuation, the, ag the agreement, the trade facilitation agreement, encourages advanced ruling. It is not mandatory, it's not uh, an, an obligation to provide advanced binding ruling. So, in the cases of 
custom supervision. The advanced ruling would not like tell you what the value is, but will tell you what are the principles that would be applied when determining the customs value. And all those principles are found in the agreement on customs valuation. So there are members who have advanced ruling and which are binding also on customs valuation. And they are these uh, advanced rulings, they are published. They are published on their website. And of course, they will um, delete those confidential information that uh, on those that are published. But still, they give that advanced ruling on customs valuation. Not the value, but the principles. I think I've answered the question, or if not, I will. Uh, pardon. Il me prend, ça prend parfois un peu de temps pour brancher le micro, je suis désolée. Donc, euh, l'accord sur la félicitation des échanges prévoit effectivement que l'on puisse dire euh, les décisions qui ont été prises euh, auparavant, euh, au préalable. Euh, donc, euh, tout membre peut euh, fournir des informations effectivement sur ces décisions euh, préalables, spécifiquement sur la facilitation et l'origine. Euh, mais il faut dire que l'AFE encourage, mais ne rend pas contraignant la fourniture de ces décisions euh, euh, préalables. Euh, et euh, il faut dire que c'est un principe qui s'applique euh, de manière générale pour tout ce qui est évaluation. Et ceci d'ailleurs se trouve dans l'accord sur euh, l'évaluation en douane. Mais ces décisions préalables, elles sont disponibles, elles se trouvent sur les sites des membres. Bien entendu, elles sont anonymisées. Euh, tous les éléments confidentiels en ont été euh, retirés. Et il faut dire aussi que ces, euh, ces informations euh, n'indiquent pas de valeur, mais simplement les principes sur lesquels on s'est basé. Thank you, Lexman, and uh, thank you for uh, to be interpreter also, because we know those are very technical terms. It's not always to, to, to understand them right at the beginning. So thank you, both of you. And, Thank you also to all the participants who joined us today for the track one. As you know, we had two tracks running in parallel, and you've been following this one. This is track one, and I've been your host today, I'm the facilitator of this track. My name is Ludovic Tane. I'm the head of communications at the WCO, and it has been my ultimate honor and pleasure to be with you today. I'll let the interpreter translate this one and then I'll give you one last announcement. Euh, voilà, je, nous arrivons à la fin de notre session. Je voudrais vous remercier tous, l'intervenant en particulier, mais également tous les participants, euh, pour l'intérêt. Euh, L'organisateur s'est présenté, il est responsable de la communication au sein de l'OMD, mais malheureusement l'interprète n'a pas saisi son nom. Et euh, voilà, nous terminons aujourd'hui la première partie de Track One, et j'espère que vous avez tous pris beaucoup de plaisir à suivre ces informations. Juste pour rajouter, alors mon nom c'est Ludo Tané, je suis chef de la communication à l'Organisation mondiale des douanes. So, um, thank you again. Um, just maybe if you want those who join us only for this session, so that you know the presentations will be on our event website. And the recording of all of today's sessions, including the questions and answers, will be available on WSU Click platform. This is another platform where you would have more details about how to get access to this one if you send an email to capacity.building at wcomg.org. Don't, don't bother about this. You'll have to note it down. You will receive an email with all these details. So everyone who participated, you will receive all the details of how to get access later on to all the recordings. So from my side, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I will be moderating track two tomorrow, and my colleague Yara Norris will be moderating track one. So enjoy your morning or evening from wherever you are, and thank you for participating in the WCO Knowledge Academy for Customs and Trade.